Hey folks, uh, today's session of the Minnesota Senate Agriculture Broadband and Rural Development Committee for Monday, April 8th, 2024 is now in session. Thanks for being here, everybody. A quorum is present, and as a reminder, all bills uh, discussed today will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, our first order of business is Senate File 5125, Senator Kunish, uh, Eligibility Modification for Sustainable Agriculture Demonstration Grant. Senator Kunish, if you would, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Should I begin? All right. So I have before you Senate File 5125. This is a st Sustainable Agriculture Demonstration Grant Program, SUSTAG, and it has been around since 1989. It was established to help farmers, nonprofits, and agriculture researchers and educators explore ways to enhance the sustainability of a wide range of farming systems. The program was originally funded through dedicated biennial appropriations, but fund, funding shifted to the AGRI program in fiscal year 2013. The program funds um, projects that research or demonstrate farm-based agriculture techniques or systems that address energy efficiency, environmental benefits, and or profitability. Grantees report annually on their progress and their reports are compiled and published by the MDA in the Green Book so that other farmers and researchers can learn from their experiences. Grantees also hold or host field days at the completion of their projects. The projects have ex that have been explored um, are a wide variety of farming systems, crops and ideas. Recent projects have investigated grazing Kernza as a dual purpose crop for forage and grain production, growing cherries and commercial hop production in central Minnesota, the profitability of peonies in northwestern Minnesota, and peonies are my favorite flowers, so I'm glad to hear that, and using uh, sheep and cover crops in a strawberry rotation, using hazelnut as protein replacement in free range poultry systems. The statute limits uh, eligible recipients to just farmers, educational institutions, individuals at educational institutes, and nonprofit organization. Unfortunately, this excludes several types of organizations that, um, with their capacity, ex uh, their capacity to try to innovate technique and try new ideas. So this bill would simply expand eligibility to organizations such as farms, agriculture cooperatives, tribal governments, and local units of government, including soil and water conservation districts. And that is my bill. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Members, um, uh, questions, comments, concerns for Senator Kunish on Senate File 5125? Oops. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, is there any other testifiers, uh, Senator Kunish? I Senator don't Kunish. have any, but um, if you have a question, the Department of Agriculture is available. So, so Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Kunish, um, what's, what's, what's kind of the driving force for this expansion? And uh, every time we expand, of course, there's always a uh, comp competition for dollars, and it's gone on for... 30, what, 30 uh, plus years now. Mm -hmm. We expand it, all of a sudden it's just going to mean there's more pressure for dollars and then we've got to feed the, find, find a way to fit it into the target. And so don't we kind of undermine the target of, of uh, helping farmers by expanding it? So I guess what's the need for the push? And then I'm going to wrap into this question for expeditious uh, this hopefully local units of government who who are the local units of government that we're trying to get into farming Senator Kunish sure so um, because it has been limited to educational institutions um, and individuals at those educational institutions and nonprofit um, this bill we are trying to open it up to farms so that they can try some of these new ideas. Um, some of the egg cooperatives, of course, they didn't exist back in uh, when this was initially created. And uh, as you talk about uh, local units of government, I would imagine that there are some 
townships or municipalities that might have an opportunity or a creative idea within their, their boundaries that they would like to give it a, a go? Senator Kunish, if you think it would be beneficial, we could ask one of our good friends at the Department of Agriculture if they have an opinion or, or further detail that they'd like to offer. Sure, that'd be lovely. If you would please state your full name for the record and then commence your testimony when you're ready. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, my name is Ashley Bress. I work as the Assistant Director of, of the Ag Marketing and Development Division at the, at the department. Um, at, 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 at its very core, this, this bill um, doesn't functionally change the pro, pro program. The program is still focused on farmer-centric projects. It really just ex expands the types of organizations that are eligible to apply. Um, since the beginning of this program, um, the projects always have to have a farmer who is deeply involved in the project, either who is leading the project or who is assisting one of the um, one of the other experts on it. Um, but but this uh, bill would just enable it. So some of those other organizations are working with working closely with actual farmers can do things like serve as a fiscal agent on a project. The way that the language is written right now, it wouldn't it it does not allow for that type of arrangement. So, Senator Weston. Mr. Chair, um, so is there a reporting uh, provision that, that happens with these grants and so other farmers uh, receive the same information that says, oh, if you uh, grow cherries on top of your picket fence, they grow better and so this is more sustainable and and how do, how do we spread that information around currently and what would be required of somebody receiving these grants? So, or or are the grants just to subsidize somebody growing this or raising this kind of livestock, and 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 not benefiting with research and information back? Ms. Bress. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. Uh, one of the major focuses of this program is, you know, is uh, these farmers, these organizations sharing what they found with other farmers. You know, one of the things that we know is that farmers are some of the best innovators out there. So this grant just gives them the opportunity to try something new, something novel, something they haven't, you know, that hasn't been a, a, explore thoroughly before. Uh, so mo most of these projects last two to three years. Um, each year there is an update about the project that is published in our annual green book that we've now been putting out for the last 30 plus years. Um, and then also at the culmination of each project there's, an, uh, there's a longer article in that green book. Um, and then the, um, the grant recipient also hosts a field day or does some other type of outreach act ac Activity to share what they're able to find with other farmers and other organizations that would be interested in it. You know, we do often have folks who call us up because you can tell that they're interested in starting to farm, but we really do uh, our best to explain to them that this isn't, you know, a, a, a learning to farm grant. It's, uh, you know, you have a new idea and you want to try something new and novel. So we really place a big focus on those outreach act, act, activities. Senator Westrom. And Mr. Chair, uh, so you mentioned the green book. Is that something the Department of Ag keeps and puts together? Is it something through the university system and extension? Because the grants largely have gone through kind of a university or a research uh, leg of, of, of the recipients. Uh, so there's kind of a natural documentation and a place to, to do the research. Um, so the, the green book, little more details on that, where's that, who, who gets that, and then coupled with that, on, if we did this expansion, those same requirements are going to still remain for the farmer, they're going to have to uh, get it documented and, and have the information in the Green Book. Ms. Bress? Uh, 
Mr. Chair, Senator West, Westrom, um, all of the projects are documented in the Green Book. I'm that, I, I almost grabbed a copy on my way over here. I wish I would have grabbed one, but it really is you know, a 150-page document that we put out each year. Um, it is also available on our website. We're actually tran tran going through some transition period to, to make that more accessible than what it has been in the past. But right now, it is, it's fully online. It is available to folks. Um, hard, hard copies are also sent out to others who are interested, thinking about soil and water con conservation districts in, in particular. And like they and tribal governments would be a couple of the organizations that would be newly eligible. Uh, these projects really are farmer driven. It often is a farmer who is taking the lead on a project and then they may bring in a technical co cooperator from somewhere like Extension or Minnesota State, but these really are generally farmer driven projects that may or may not have somebody from the university involved with them, but they do always include somebody either from the university, from Extension, from Minnesota State, from a soil and water conservation district, somebody who has some of the other tech technical expertise. Senator Wester. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think this is my last question, but so. Remind us how much uh, are the grants uh, typically or how much can they be? And then do the same recipients uh, get them year after year for same or similar projects? Ms. Press, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, uh, each each year these grants are funded out of the Agri program. We're generally in, it comes out of some of the unearmarked funds. Uh, we're generally looking at somewhere between between two hundred and fifty thousand and three hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year that is made available. Most years we're doing somewhere between eight and twelve projects. It just kind of depends upon you know what what the applications look like in that per, particular round. Organizations or the grant um, applicants can request up to $25,000 that is not matched, and then uh, they can request an additional $25,000 for a maximum award of $50,000. But, but according to the statute, that second $25,000 has to be matched dollar for a dollar. Senator Western. Sure, just the part about are, are the recipients the same year after year typically or sometimes or does it have to be a completely new project essentially can they use the money to raise the same crop or the same livestock or the same project they they worked on the, the prior year or two miss press yeah mr chair senator westrom my apologies for missing that part of the question um these uh organizations or entities, farmers could receive a grant in multiple years, but more often than not, that is absolutely not the, the case. Um, you know, far, f farmers will work on, on their one grant over that two, two to three year period, and they would certainly be eligible to apply <coughs> again, but this isn't one that we see folks coming back for year af, 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 after year. Members, any other questions or comments for Senator Kunish or testifier? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it says in uh, line 1.7, made to farmers, and then uh, on line 1.8 it says farms. So if farmer Jim Jones applies for a grant and he decides that because of the way things are going, it's for a sp specific crop that he's going to raise, but his son, who uh, has decided to uh, incorporate with his brothers, say John Jones, uh, into the Jones Farms. Could they then uh, apply for a grant too? So Jim Jones, even though he's part of the corporation, uh, but he's going to do for a certain cro crop, mentioned Kernza, or, and the Jones decide they're gonna go for uh, some new crop called, well, you name the, the crop, flax or whatever. Um, could, they, could they both get uh, grants for their projects? Ms. Brass. All right. uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, um, then the type of setup you're, uh, that I, I think you're going towards, both entities would be eligible, both Mr. Jones as well as like Jones Family Farms, per, per, perhaps, that, except under the current language, Jones Family Farms would not be eligible for this program, the way that the language is written, the way that the language is written or, or was written, um, it was, 
but Mr. only Mr. Jones would be eligible as a farm, but Jones family farm would would be would would become newly eligible through this uh, language change. So, Mr. Senator. Chair, so farmer Jim Jones would not qualify, but his, the Jones Farm Incorporated would qualify. Senator, uh, Ms. Bruss? Uh, Ms. Ms. Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, uh, it's actually the opposite there. Um, under current language, of the, the, the way that the statute is currently written, Mr. Jones is eligible as a farmer, but Jones Farm Incorporated is not currently eligible uh, as a farm. Uh, so this proposed language would make Jones Family or Jones Family Farm Incorporated eligible. So, Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson. So, if if uh, Mr. Jim Jones, who is a separate farmer, but become because his sons decide to incorporate, then he could be eligible under the the Jones Family Farm uh, and and get some of that money to utilize for his project. Ms. Bress. Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson. Uh, yes, I think you have that. Cor cor correct. One thing just, just to keep in mind that these grants are not intended to be like just general grants to start up farming, uh, but they really are intended to, um, to try something brand new. Um, so, you know, in this case, both, I mean, if, if Mr. Jones wanted to be involved with project, with multiple projects, those two projects would have to be trying, like, would have to have two completely different projects with like different problem statements, different, wanting to try completely different things. Senator Anderson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, any other questions or comments for Senator Kunish or her testifier? Seeing none, uh, Senate File 5125 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Senator Putnam, you have uh, Senate file 5049, and I believe you have a couple of amendments. Would you like to start with those, or do you want to start with an overview of the file? The Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, and I, I want to say I'm, I'm grateful to Senator Kunish for getting the controversial one out of the way today. Um, at least Tori laughed a little bit. Um, uh, yes, uh, Senator Kunish, if we could, please, let's deal with the amendments. I'd like to move the A2 amendment, please. Okay, uh, Senator Putnam moves the A2 amendment, and we should all have that, correct? Yes. Uh, members, the amendments that we have before us, I will soon be offering the A4 amendment in a moment as well. These two uh, amendments are basically just clarifying and uh, getting things in the proper order, both amendments are, but uh, we'll deal with the A2 amendment uh, initially. Okay, uh, any discussion on the A2 amendment? Seeing none, I'll, oh, yeah, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, this the language getting it in the shape you you want it, uh, Chair Putnam. Uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Chair. And, uh, yes, thank you for that question, Senator Westrom. The, the, the uh, first amendment is on the language, and the second amendment is on the date uh, exclusively. So these are simply and, clarifying endeavors. And I think I've got it right here. Second, Mr. Chair, uh, Sir Putnam, I think you've got in the A two. It's deleting section eight, which ties to Senator Kunish's bill. Is that correct? Senator Putnam. I believe so. Ms. Painter, if you wouldn't mind, could you? Ms. Painter. Mr. Chair, remember, Section 8 is a cannabis bill from Senator Port. Um, we didn't want to keep that in this bill. Um, and so, Mr. Chair, and uh, we can talk about it more, but I, I thought that was part of what we were going to work on fixing in this committee. And so I was just wondering why we're taking it out in the A2 amendment. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Senator Westrom. That is still, as I understand it, the ambition. Um, but it's a question of what language is in the actual cannabis bill as well. Uh, so this is something that is still, I think, being sorted out and ironed out. That's my understanding, at least, Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom. Any other discussion? 
If not, okay. And Senator Putnam, you also need to move the A four. I can move. Uh, I move the A four amendment as well. Then, if I may, please. Okay. Sure. I think we have to vote on the A two first. That's what I thought. So. Not. All right. The A four is an amendment to the A two. Oh, I see. So we'll need to move the A four first. Then I move the A four amendment, please, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any discussion on the A four amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A4 signify saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? A4 amendment is adopted to the A2 amendment. Now uh, to the A2 amendment. Uh, any more discussion or anybody? All those in favor? As amended, yes, thank you. Uh, any more discussion? If not, uh, all those in favor of the A2 amendment as amended signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The A2 as amended is adopted. Senator Putnam to the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you to Senator Western for pointing out that, uh, uh, reminding us all that it was a week or two ago, uh, this issue of the language around what an uh, uh, emerging or beginning or um, a uh, limited access farmer would be is something that we started to talk about when we were talking about it in the context of the cannabis bill. And I promised you that we would have a day to sort this out. And today is that day. Today is our day to engage with the complexity uh, and the difficulty of uh, this complicated issue. Uh, on its base, this bill alters the language in the down payment assistance program to focus work on the condition rather than through the use of a protected class. Germane changes are present in lines 2.8 to 2.14. Uh, in this language, we articulate the characteristics of a limited access farmer as one who has limited access to land or limited access to a market. Now, members, um, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to nerd out on this one a little bit because this is within the field of my scholarly expertise. Uh, many of you may know that I have a PhD in rhetoric, which means I am literally a doctor of argument, which is the nerdiest thing in the history of the world. But the kinds of arguments that I study are those arguments in American history that have expanded or restricted the scope of what it means to be a full American. That's what I study. The past 400 years of arguments about what it means to participate in American democracy. Um, and that perspective, I think, is incredibly useful as we struggle with this larger issue right now. Uh, and I think it's with this background that we can have a better discussion if we're clear on some theoretical and some historical truths. The first of which, uh, on the theory front, is that even though we think government is objective and our rights are radically individual, it isn't and they aren't, never has been. Government makes rules based on identity categories and group membership. That's just what it does theoretically. And the most obvious example of this is the individual rights that we enjoy and the privileges that we enjoy are a function of our membership in the class of citizen or non-citizen or 18-year-old versus 21-year-old. Government makes distinctions about populations all the time. That's what it does. So oftentimes when we hear programs like this, we hear, well, shouldn't we treat everyone equally? Uh, we never have treated everyone equally. Um, that's just not a thing that happens in governance. It's not a thing that government can do because even though our rights are part of our individual possession, they are only real as we are parts of groups or categories of people. Um, now, we have uh, made all kinds of rules given to specific populations throughout U.S. history. I'd like to draw your attention specifically to the Freedmen's Bureau which between 1864 and 1866 was advocated for by what we call radical Republicans at the time. And this was the creation of an entire agency to provide resources, education, actual money, and land for people who had been enslaved. We have, throughout history of our country, seen some populations and realized our responsibility to aid those populations in their participation in the greater American promise. We see that in the Freedmen's Bureau, which again was advocated by the radical Republicans in the day, vetoed, unfortunately, by Andrew Johnson, boo, hiss, but it still did fantastic work treating a population and lifting it up. And why is that so important? Why is it important to lift up a population? Well, friends, we, we may think in a very naive sense about the history of capitalism, that it's all radical individualism and everybody's got to do what they got to do. But the prophet of capitalism, our friend Adam Smith, in the book Wealth of Nations, makes perfectly clear that the role of government is to create competition, not greed. So even if you aren't persuaded by any of the moral arguments that you hear today, even if in hearing of the struggles of farmers of color and beginning farmers, even if that doesn't move you at all, if you truly are committed to the principles of capitalism, you want competition, you want people to be able to compete. 
That's what the Down Payment Assistance Program does. It enables people to compete in a difficult market of being in agriculture. There are, as I suggested earlier, moral arguments here, but this is a very practical one. If we want a thriving Minnesotan economy, everyone needs to participate in it because everyone needs to compete. What we're talking about today is consistent with American theory, with American history, with American practice, and with today's deep and powerful contemporary need, which is something that I don't feel fully comp uh, competent to discuss right now which is why I'm so incredibly grateful that we have testifiers here who can tell you about what it's like to be a struggling farmer in the state of Minnesota right now, who wants to compete, who wants to grow their business and live the lifestyle of a farmer. We have people here who can share that story with you. And I, the narrative that I've gone through today is a way of focusing our attention on this exact language and its concerns. I'm not interested in being distracted uh, with discussions about the larger program, because if I just doc documented, um, that's clearly within uh, a legal and historical uh, uh, trajectory is appropriate. So if we struggle with this bill and we struggle with this language, that struggle is about whether or not the people who are here to testify about their needs and desires to be a farmer, if they are worthy Members, Mr. Chair, I believe they are. I think you believe they are. And now we're all about to hear about it. So if we could move to testimony, that would be wonderful, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Uh, our first testifier is uh, Angela Dawson, who I believe is online. I am. Hey. Oh, great. Let's turn on mm -hmm. your camera and uh, we can hear you. Uh, just state your name for the record and you can begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Putnam. My name is Angela Dawson. I am a founder and CEO of what's called the 40 Acre Cooperative and also uh, the Great Rise. The 40 Acre Cooperative is about uh, four and a half years old, an organization that I founded in North Central Minnesota to actually deal with the very issues that this committee is addressing today, which is the lack of resources for farmers of color in the state of Minnesota. I should also mention that uh, I am come from a family of uh, four generations. I am the fourth generation Dawson farmer in this region. My grandparents ran a very uh, bustling hub for an Iowa family, but was never able to own. They were always kept in a sharecropper position. I'm the first farmer in the family who's been able to own their own property. Indeed, I am speaking on behalf of this program, even though I would not be a beneficiary of the program. Uh, but I do know that there is a great uh, need for diversity, and I think that uh, the pandemic was a great example and showed us about the lack, uh, what happens in our communities when there's a lack of, of farmers, small sustainable farmers, who are able to operate when the larger food system is taken down for whatever reason. And so um, I'm speaking on behalf of this program and in support of emerging farmers, even though I don't quite meet the definition and wouldn't be able to benefit from any of the programs that are coming out of here. I think that the cultural sort of war that has ensued because of the uh, move for equity within agriculture is, uh, is going to be found to be on the wrong side of history. I think that uh, even if you don't go for uh, sort of the moral arguments. I think there's so many reasons why we want to encourage competition in the industry as Senator Putnam has, has laid out. And that's specifically around um, us being able to access and bring Minnesota's agricultural market to a more equitable status in the country and to be able to compete in these emerging areas like hemp, uh, like cannabis, like all of these other new specialty crops that a lot of farmers of color are specializing in. And so I just wanted to make sure that um, the committee knows that there is an organization called 40 Acre Co-op in this state. We're working to help create more equity within the entire region for farmers of color. But, it, but really uniquely, we work with a lot of white rural farmers as well. And you'd be surprised at how many uh, of these farmers are also looking for alternative ways to farm than what has been historically handed to them, which has been typically debt. 
And so we need to look at agriculture in a different way. We need to look at agriculture in a, in a more inclusive way that involves, that includes folks who you haven't thought about before. I, and my last point I just want to say is that even though I, as I repeated, I, I don't fit this emerging farmer definition. I do want to say that my family is a part of the original farmers of this country. And farming is the original occupation uh, and the first occupation of this country. And my family had a very strong impact on the progress of agriculture, in, not only in this country, but specifically in this region. And so I have, uh, even though I might not benefit from this program, I need help. In our 40-acre co-op, we need more farmers who are able, who have the capacity, who have the land, and who have uh, some of the training and the skills that would be available through these programs in order to farm and prosper. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Dawson. Uh, next testifier is uh, Zoe Holloman. Thank you. Thank you. You just say, state your name for the record and you can begin your testimony. My name is Zoe Holloman. Um, first, I'd like to thank the committee, Chair Putnam, and um, the other members of the committee, especially to those who listen to the needs of marginalized, um, and in particular, farmers of color. My name is Zoe Holloman. I am a farmer of color in Annandale, Minnesota um, at Root Springs Farm and Retreat Co-op in Wright County. I am also the executive director of the Midwest Farmers of Color Collective, um, organizing with over 130 urban, rural, and suburban farmers and allied organizations in Minnesota and surrounding states. We work for racial equity in our food and farming systems. We host social gatherings and educational events, um, policy education. We gather priorities from farmers of color in the state and in the region. And we work with um, many allies to advocate for a more fair, equal, and uh, sustainable food system and for food sovereignty. And I'm heartened to see many of our friends and allies here today. I would first like to start off by saying that the reason that we're here today, um, renegotiating verbiage for emerging, emerging farmer, um, which includes farmers of color, LGBTQ farmers, veteran farmers, women farmers, and farmers with disability, in our policies is due to lawsuits by political legal entities and a local farmer who has access to land and economic resources that those of us who fall into these other categories like emerging farmers, BIPOC farmers, under-resourced farmers do not. Um, and so we want, they want to remove our ability to make Reparate, reparative efforts to communities who have been discriminated against. And this is very saddening and discouraging um, to myself and the farmers that are part of our network. We work with farmers who are indigenous, whose land we are all on right now, land that was stolen through violence and white supremacist policies. Um, we work with farmers who are descendants of enslaved Africans whose labor built the great wealth of this country's foundation. Um, African American farmers have been discriminated against by the USDA as cited in cases like Pickford versus Glickman lawsuit among others. Um, we work with farmers who are um, immigrants of color um, who have been discriminated against and exploited um, Hmong farmers and other Asian um, Pacific Island farmers, Latinx farmers and farm workers, um, many of whom pick the food that we all eat. Um, various African farmers, Kenyan, Somali, Nigerian, Sudanese, um, who have received in this country um, who've received discrimination just in trying to get like the same rights and benefits afforded to many European uh, descended American citizens. Um, we saw through the American Recovery Act, um, which was passed by Congress in 2021, um, which affirmed that the majority of our federal leaders in Congress believe that some reparative reparative measures should be taken to help address the historic and current day disparities in land and resources in farming for marginalized farmers. And there should be no question 
that there are significant racial and social equity disparities cited by our nation's agricultural census, National Young Farmers Coalition's national survey, many state and county agency reports on economic and health statistics, and research from our own emerging farmer reports. This data shows that state-funded programs have not been equally accessed, and we should make provisions in programs to help level the playing field in food and agriculture. But what is not clear, I believe, but what is not clear is that while under-resourced farmers were discriminated against, many European descended farmers were elevated in their advantages and privileges in accessing land, credit, capital, markets, technical assistance, and other agricultural programs that enabled them to accumulate generational wealth in their families and businesses. But today, we are being made to act as if these well-documented socioeconomic statistics aren't correct and that we can't safely state them in policy, not attempt to create policies to bring equity to the situation for fear of legal ramifications. Um, that feels wrong and we should all bear witness to this experience of what is institutional racism unfolding in our legislature, requiring this process of making race and gender neutral policy. That said, we need to support ways for under-resourced farmers to have a fair shot at starting and building their farm businesses and not losing these opportunities that we have fought so hard for. I am proud to have seen colleagues and allies in food and farming organizations behind me um, and also at the MDA and with Chair Putnam um, band together to find other ways to help bring these resources to those who need them most. Please support the bill as amended and we urge our legislators and state agency staff to continue to work cooperatively with emerging farmers and farmers of color to advocate for equity measures in our food and agricultural policy moving forward. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have Amanda Kohler. And you can just state your name and you can begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for having me today. My name is Amanda Kohler and I am the policy manager for the Land Stewardship Project. For over 40 years, LSP has engaged tens of thousands of Minnesotans in building a more just and sustainable farm and food system and healthy communities. Decade after decade, our 4,500 members and nearly 60,000 supporters, the vast majority of whom are white farmers and rural folks, have stood up to say that we must address the historic and ongoing racism within our farm and food system. Last session, we celebrated that our legislature took an important step towards not only recognizing the importance of emerging farmers, but reckoning, taking a step towards reckoning with our state and country's history of generations of disenfranchisement of historically underserved populations, particularly farmers who are black, indigenous, and people of color. Our farm and food system is more resilient and just when we have a more diversified farming population and more people on the land but now we're here, forced to take a step backwards. We should not be in the position of having to choose between the future of these programs and the prioritization of emerging farmers within them. But because we are in this position, we have been working alongside our allies, um, who Zoe mentioned are also behind me now, um, and, and others to ensure legislative changes work for emerging farmers. LSP supports um, the bill as amended and also believes that those most impacted by public policy um, should be deeply engaged in its development. As the disability justice movement says, quote, nothing about us without us. So we wanna thank MDA and Chair Putnam's office for collaborating with our organizations and workshopping this language that we all feel comfortable moving forward with. And now I'm gonna put my personal hat on for a moment. I'm an aspiring farmer. My husband and I just finished LSP's Farm Beginnings class um, and we're piloting a very tiny egg business off of our property in St. Paul, just about a mile north of here, um, until we can expand on more acreage outside of the metro. We both grew up in upper middle class families. We both own our own home, we, well, we own our own home together 
and, uh, and have two vehicles. I have a master's degree and no student debt. We aren't even close to having the capital that we need to start farming. We live paycheck to paycheck for several greater economic reasons. But we have our upper middle class parents that will probably be able to ask them for help with a down payment. The down payment assistance program isn't for us. It's for those who don't have the generational wealth to lean on as a safety net and as an investment you know, firm for us. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the testifier list, I have uh, Relindis Tagomo. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You can just state your name and then you can begin your testimony. My name is Relendez Tegomo and uh, I come from Roseville. Um, when I open my mouth, you already know she's a re recent comma <laughs> <laughs> because the accent from my motherland is still there. When I arrived in Minnesota, it was cold in May, and I asked my husband, because I joined him here, why would you choose Minnesota of all places? It was cold that May. But like my, I would say, just like my kids say these days, Minnesota is home. When my family, they don't visit here, after July, they don't come here. And they ask me, why don't you move? I said, that's because this is home. I'm a Minnesotan. Uh, I might have just come lately, but I'm truly a Minnesotan. My first tomato was planted in my backyard on a little raised bed on 1721 Randolph Avenue. Hmm. It was given to us by our friend Chris Berghaus. And I grew up growing crops with my mother in Cameroon. And when I was coming here, my first fear was I was not going to be able to find the food that I was used to eating. And, and that was true. When I got here, there was no jamanjama, jamma, there was no uh, greens, there was sweet potato leaves, was hard to find in the stores. So I came with two little boys in two, and I was confused. Uh, I intentionally picked my first house with a backyard so that I could grow my greens. Since 97, I have been growing in my backyard on 645 Terrace Drive. And I have been gainfully employed and a taxpayer since I came to this country. I'm driven to success. I came here, started as a teacher, then wasn't finding fulfillment because, not because the kids were not great, everybody was great and they were very helpful, but it was because the culture was so different. Uh, we had come here not out of choice, we are refugees to start off with. My husband had to leave home and I joined him. It was hard for us. But when I touched the soil, I knew I was home. So I have stayed. I started growing those greens and I have fed them. And then I opened my first business, just braiding hair. I have had that business for over 20 years and then the pandemic hit. And for the first time in my life, I couldn't bring a paycheck home. It was a horrible feeling to be on unemployment. I've never, never depended on anybody for a paycheck. I have worked since I was a child, and then I had to, even though I've always paid taxes, but I found myself taking. Then I said, here I am, I can grow food. That's something that was nature to me. I was growing food, feeding my neighbors, they harvested from my garden, I compost, they brought their home waste to my backyard, and in exchange, they harvested. And then I said, I can make money doing this. And 
I decided how, how I was going to get about doing this. Thanks to programs like the Emerging Farmers Program, I attended the conference last year, got a lot of resources. I registered there. They've been teaching. I've already had the first training class on how to uh, take care of a BCS, how to take care of a tractor's equipment that I didn't grow up using to farm, but which I know if I have to have a successful business here, I have to know how to operate these equipments. I have learned that. I have taken class um, through the uh, Central Lakes Community College on how to run a successful business, farm business, that with a scholarship of $100. $1,900, and all these programs are programs that you, our lawmakers, have made available to us beginning farmers. This is, these are programs that we are benefiting from. We are, we are in a new place, and we want to contribute to this, our community. We want to be competitive and make money. We don't just want to farm. Yeah, I've been farming to feed family, but now I want to make money. I want to be successful. And I have to learn. I, we all make mistakes, but we don't need to make the mistakes where, which other people have made and which we can gain from their knowledge. I have farmers like Laura from Loon Organics helping me to mentor me on how to be a successful farmer here with the challenging weather and things like that. So. My ask is, please do not cut some of these programs. Help us to be successful, as you guys have been doing. And also, uh, we want to be able to sell our products to you. We farm good food, and we hope that you guys enjoy them. And we'll introduce some of our crops that we have grown up eating to our community here. This is our home. Our kids are from here. So they have to go to the market and see that these are the crops that we also farm. So please, I'm just asking that you guys help us be as successful as our community, which is you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, will be online. Uh, we have uh, Lily Emboss. If you are there, you can turn on your camera, uh, state your name for the record, and you can begin your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the Senate Committee. My name is Lillian Moss. I live out in Cover County. I'm an emerging farmer and part of a five-women group, all of African descent, known as Tulime. Tulime is a Swahili word that means to cultivate. Let's cultivate. And so Tulime was born post the pandemic, and it was a way of therapy for us. We were dealing with a lot then, and we needed something to keep us sane, and we thought, why not farming? It started off as therapy and now has become more as a hobby for us, and we are even looking at it more for something that could grow bigger uh, to be a source of income for us. Tulime um, started off without having any place to grow. We didn't even know where we'd get a piece of land. We didn't have any money. But thanks to a good Samaritan, a fellow African immigrant, who gave us a piece of land out in Cochrane. And he gave us this space. And every farming season, we'd go there. We'd never paid him a penny. He was just kind to us and allowed us to use that space. This helped us bond so much. We ended up loving it so much. But unfortunately, last year in 2023, that land was sold, put us back to ground zero. And now we had to think of what are we going to do in 2023? The farming season has begun. At that time, in tireless efforts, we were able to get public space out in St. Paul and started farming You know, a bit late, but we got a few beds there, and at least we continued doing what we love doing the most. Well, as it goes, public space, public for everybody. The one thing we never thought about was we are going to plant all this food, and at the time of harvest, 
it was everybody's harvest. So to say the least, one time we went to harvest and most of the produce was gone. But we just had to smile about it, remembering farmers are kind people, they love each other and they share. But that was a learning, that was an opportunity. And so with that, we are here where we are looking for land and thinking about this bill, a bill that would potentially jeopardize farmers like us. And we are asking, rather than having short-term leases, um, less than three years, why don't we consider long-term leases for farmers with the potential to own? Better yet, owning land would be way better, but we know what land access is and the issues that come with that. That's a whole different story, and I know we are working through ensuring that things can be way better than they've been in the past. But the main goal here is to allow security for farmers who work really, really, really hard. And... Um, just giving them that opportunity to feel that they have this um, potential to have financial stability and security in knowing that they have this long-term lease as opposed to the short-term leases, these opportunities to be able to own their own land and be able to grow their dreams to levels beyond anything that we've all imagined. Farming is beautiful, but it's these challenges that make it really, really difficult, almost to a point one feels like giving up, but we cannot give up. You cannot give up in the food industry. And so that is the ask, is to allow for more long-term uh, leases with potential to own better yet to own the land. But the other consideration that I'm requesting is to have some form of um, um, cap to the uh, income requirement so that it's somewhere less than maybe 75,000 annually because it even takes many years to get to that for the average farmer. So the ask would be either allowing those long-term leases or at least considering income at a certain level, probably something less than 75,000. I truly appreciate this opportunity and I know I know you all have our hearts, uh, interests at heart, and we hope that you will uh, support uh, most of what we are requesting for because it's for the common good of the larger community. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Uh, our next testifier is also online. It is uh, Ori Taylor. And if you are there, you can turn your camera on, state your name for the record, and you can begin your testimony. Thank you very much. I hope you can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. My name is Ardala Taylor. Um, thank you all for, for having me here to testify. I am the owner of Taylor Ventures LLC. I farm at Big River Farm in Marine on St. Croix. It's an incubator farm that gives us access to land. It gives me access to land and trains me. My background is in science and engineering, and I got into farming because I was interested in applying scientific principles of, of, and engineering principles to achieving nutrient density in food. Um, in fact, I'm actually one of the recipients of the Agri-Sustained Grants that was mentioned. I'm currently executing this. Um, so um, farming is not my full-time job, obviously doesn't pay the bills. I'm a single mom of three boys. Um, my first year farming at Big River, I grossed $4,000 and just um, learning, getting the experience. But I also had a lot of waste because I didn't have access to markets. Um, and so I, thinking in innovatively, um, I organized, um, helped organize a group of farmers. We're currently at 10. We have, some of us have a quarter acre of land. Some of us, like me, I have about a, an acre of land. So we needed access to markets and we needed flexibility um, because we can't full-time chase markets or farmer's markets or uh, co-ops and things like that. So we were able to really um, benefit from the farm to school program. We um, aggregated and, and sold to Minneapolis public schools and, and several other school districts through the farm to school program, which is a, a, a program I, we, we are very appreciative of. And so, um, um, allowing us, uh, so allowing farmers um, to have, um, 
you know, multi-year, multi-year leases um, and being able to go to incubator farms, being able to work together and having no restrictions in terms of market access is really critical because um, we all have to keep our full-time jobs. <laughs> so um, we, we need to have some flexibility in how we go after markets and, and how we farm. So as I mentioned, my first year, my gross sales was 4,000. But because we worked together as farmers and we aggregated, we were able to, I was able to reach 17,000 gross sales last year. Lots of, lots of expenses, and I'll explain that in a minute. But again, allowing this direct and indirect access to markets without limitation was critical for me going from 4,000 to 17,000 in gross sales um, last year. Um, so as I also mentioned, the Agri-Sustain grant and working on nutrient density in food. Um, the key to nutrient-dense food, which we're learning, uh, getting away from chemical fertilizer. By the way, Big River Farm is an is a organic certified farm, so I use organic and regenerative practices. Um, it, the key to it is, is your soil health. So I spend easily um, $2,000 in, in, in less than an acre of land on compost and amendments. Um, natural um, natural cures for the for the for the land and um, you know um, various plants and, and beneficial insects and things like that. Um, luckily, as I mentioned, this every sustained grant, I was I'm able to although I fund um, a lot of my expenses up front, I'm able to get some reimbursement for some of of the things that I spend. Um, but the key, as I said, is 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 investing in your soil health. So having unlimited le- um, access to leasing land. Um, I, I don't want to spend, you know, people don't want to spend, you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars on land to improve the land and then have to walk away because they cannot lease um, multi-year leases. So that's another ask um, that we would like in this proposal um, that we do have access to land. And because we're very small farmers, we're growing very small spaces, but we are thinking of innovative techniques and ways to improve food access, um, pr- improve the health of, our, of ourselves and of our neighbors. And so, um, so, some of the, so again, the key things I would um, take away with is just giving us access to markets without restrictions because we all have full-time jobs. Farming is not yet, we're not able to make a living full-time at it. So we have to um, subsidize farming. So being able to go to um, farmer's market as needed or do farm to school wholesale or do whatever we need to do or aggregate together to be able to fund um, the farming is, is, very, is very critical to us and defray our expenses at the very least. And then secondly, um, being able to access land. If we, we, Most of us will be leasing land, but giving us access to multi-year leases without restrictions is also important so that we can, in fact, do right by the land and not be there for, you know, with quick chemical fertilizers and and quick, you know, quick profit. We're trying to actually do a holistic regenerative approach to the land, heal the land, and also then grow um, healthy foods for ourselves and our neighbors. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Next testifier is also online, uh, Vita Reddy. If you are there. Yes. Yes. We can hear you just fine. You can just state your name for the record. You can begin your testimony. Uh, I'm Veda Reddy. I'm a Big River Farm incubator uh, uh, participant. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So, um, Big River, uh, so my background is that I started farming. Uh, This is in 2019. And uh, 2020, in the farm, I had a tick bite. The next thing, I was diagnosed with Lyme, and I lost mobility of my, all my hands and, uh, hands and legs. And it took a while for me to recover, but then farming on my own was not easy. And that's where Big River Farm was a, big, was a very big blessing in my life. And uh, I started, I joined the program there. And there, like, I, in the beginning years, uh, like, it gave a lot of support, you know, in, in terms of training and everything that helped me catch up on whatever I'd missed in the previous years. And the most important thing was that that uh, we got was, you know, having the confidence that the land would be available again for them in the subsequent year, and then also the access to indirect markets, because direct markets require direct markets as well as CSA requires a very consistent production 
as well as uh, you know expense uh, infrastructure expense like having a cargo van and all of that and investing in it becomes harder if we are just doing farming so we all have to have a full time job as well as do farming and you know so uh, but then it takes a while to build up the income in farming where we can quit our daytime jobs so at this point of time access to long leases is important and also to uh, the indirect markets because farm to school gave us a lot of confidence like you know the mistakes that can cost us a whole market you know it's easier to cover in indirect market because uh, like ori said earlier 10 of us got together and uh, we were able to cover for each other when we had crop losses so so it's very important uh, to have that so when we are defining emerging farmer you know can we just do it at the income level because you know in every other occupation when a beginner joins there are about 10 to 20 challenges but in farming it's about 80 to 100 challenges so that that's where just having some of these things you know including people without thinking about what is the length of the lease of the land or you know the access to certain markets you know it would be very very beneficial for us Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, I think we're going to let's just possibly go quickly out of order here. Uh, Fario Khalif, I will not go out of order. You are up next. And you can state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Farhia Khalif. I am the director of SAFI, Somali American Farmers Institute. And I'm here to, um, to testify at Senate file number 5049. Um, I'm just really grateful to see some of the members that I work with, RA and Vida and and many members back there. Um, all of this uh, testify that you see in front of you is the people who are real, who are working hard every day. Like they say, they work full time, but also they also do what they love to do because some of us grew up farming and back home in Africa, but we'll continue with our love here in, in the state of Minnesota. Members, um, I really appreciate uh, Senator Brittman and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture who have been back to back doing at some community Senate discussion with the community and members and stakeholders such as some of members sitting back there. I really think this is really nothing new. Like the Senator said earlier, this has been 400 years argument. This 400 years argument, where are we at today? We're going back to square one. Systematic racism is nothing new about this country when it comes to people, blacks and in America. Uh, I really appreciate Senator Winstrom when you took the time and meet some of the African black uh, immigrants. We really appreciate you had a lot of questions. Um, some of the questions I can remember was uh, how we're going to grow as a black uh, immigrant, I mean, black African farmers coming to immigrate to the new land. It's a long process. As myself, uh, recruiting a lot of the Somali. Uh, farmers who don't really think this opportunity here in the state of Minnesota, but I tell them I'm following the policy and issues that is, is happening at the state. I go back to the community and there's a lot of farmers that we train and I'm grateful to programs such as like the Big River Farm where we, some of uh, a lot of the immigrant farmers are there. Uh, this year they're growing up to 30. It's a program that the food group, and, and I know there's so many programs that you guys already met with them, like the Land Stewardship uh, Project, who are very much advocating a land access for a lot of immigrant and black indigenous uh, communities. Uh, be, be, um, frankly, I want to say some of you want to see this is successful. And I know this is, um, when, when we look at it, the white and the black and immigrants, this is like 99.9% .9 is what uh, farmers in the state of Minnesota is owned by whites, which is fine, right? And less than 1%, less than 1% way down is where the blacks, I can speak for black because I'm black, but I'm sure there's other, whatever they fit the word emerging farmers. And there's a lot of programs that 
that this bill that uh, and Senate file uh, 5049 will support. Like Ariel Dell earlier said, when you get to the farm during the day and you're doing the work and you spend thousands of dollars, but not only the thousand dollars that you're fighting for the soil health, but also a lot of immigrant or black or indigenous uh, farmers who are not having access when it comes to you spend like eight to ten thousand dollars during this, you're not guaranteed you're going to get that money back. You're going to buy your equipment, you're going to buy your soil, you're going to buy your seeds, you're going to do all of this. But then we come back to the farmer's market, you have a limited access. So the programs that you guys, the Senate, you guys are doing for the communities all over the state of Minnesota, this is not only the blacks or indigenous or um, this land access that we're fighting for, this is all farmers. The farmers are struggling, regardless of what color you are. And I can see that you guys I want to do something good. And I know you're committed to help your communities, regardless if you're Democrat or Republican, whatever you might be. I just want to see that this amendment that the Senate is bringing forward is something that we met with him, discussed it with him. And I personally met some of you to discuss about these issues. You guys would like to see how the Minnesota will be leading one of the state and nationwide, not only just people here in the state of Minnesota. And I see some of that is that Minnesota is a, is a champion when it comes to people like me who, who's getting an opportunity to be included. So I will say, Senator Bridman, take the opportunity this year to come places like the Big River Farm or other places where a lot of incubators are doing this land access opportunity that people don't have. But also, this will give you the opportunity to see what it looks like if you limit and say, we're only going to do three years. People are spending so much money, thousands of dollars to, to a quarter acre or one acre where this access might be. Why you limit them? Let them continue to doing this pro progress for them to grow. One day they might want to do from here to, to be a landowner. So I will hope that you guys will consider and support this amendment. It's a long way to go. And I'm, 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 I'm sure that you all wanted to do the best for the um, farmers, all farmers, regardless of who it might, you might be. There's a lot of, lot of opportunity that you guys have. Senate discusses this with the community. Because you know what? You have opportunity to vote today, but the community will vote later. You know why we vote later? Because we all know that you care about the community. We're going to work with you, and this opportunity not for only blacks or, um, like I said, uh, native and other immigrants, but this is all including the white community. Like I said, we are less than 1%. Take the time, the opportunity, and support land access, and opportunity to support in this House and Senate file uh, 5049. I thank you for the time and opportunity. Thank you. And our last testifier on this bill is uh, Michael Cheney. Good day, everyone. <clears throat> hey, you can just state your name, and then uh, you can start your testimony. Uh, my name is Michael Cheney. I'm with uh, Executive Director, Founder of Project Sweetie Pie. North Minneapolis is going green. Give us a call and learn what we mean. Where once lie urban blight, now sits luscious garden sites, gardens without borders, classrooms without walls, architects of our own destinies, access to food, justice for all. And now, like sweet potato vines, our missions and goals all intertwine. Uh, people ask me, they, uh, Project Sweetie Pie, we started in 20, um, 2010, but my work in this field really started much earlier than that. In the 80s, I was the founder of the Minnesota Juneteenth Celebration. Spent 18 years growing it to be you know, one of the foremost uh, Juneteenth celebrations in the country. In the 90s, I was the founder of the Wendell Phelps Credit Union in South Minneapolis. Spent five years as a volunteer growing that project. And then in 2010, when North High came under attack, and there were those school board administrators who felt that its time had come and it gone, that myself and others that were part of a group called afro -E we were sitting around commiserating about the threat and killing of the school because we realized, as I'm sure all of you do, that the killing of a school is the killing of heart of any community. And so in all good consciousness, we couldn't sit back passively and watch that happen. 
And so Project Sweetie Pie approached the school and asked them, could we use the abandoned green room that had been fallow for the last uh, 15 years? Uh, I asked them, if we could get the youth of North Minneapolis to start growing vegetables, could we um, uh, utilize the space? They agreed, and thus Project Sweetie Pie was born. Project Sweetie Pie, the story of a community that came together, worked together for the common good of the youth and families of its community. But that's not the beginning of my food journey. I would say I'd have to go back to the turn of the century when my grandfather, a black man, left Iowa to come to Wisconsin because he was told about rich farmland beyond his imagination. So a whole host of black families saddled up, put the, filled up their saddlebags and moved to, Minnesota, to Wisconsin. Uh, eventually those farmers all left except for my grandfather. And so at one point in time he owned a thousand acres in the early 1900s. A black man from Iowa, not that long out of slavery, who realized that agriculture was the, his future and the future of this nation. Let's follow down that historical trend. In 2016, I approached the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, uh, Representative Poppy, and I asked her, we wanted to create urban farm legislation. Um, she asked me, she said, well, Michael, what's urban farming? I thought about it for a second. Same kind of uh, quant conundrum that we're here today. Are we emerging farmers? Are we beginning of farmers? Are we under-resourced farmers? My answer was, Urban farming, farming in urban areas. They did a study that, um, that year and it came back positive and so thus the Agri-Grant was born and became initiated in 2018. I'm very proud of that. Currently today, I'm also on the Midwest Farmers of Color with Zoe Holloman. We work very hard to grow growth. Growing food is easy. Our task here, one and all, is growing the next generation of farmers. And that is our task at hand, and this is what this legislation is trying to attempt. Let us help you help us. That's why we're here today. And so we're moving forward trying to create this history, this timeline that, again, make Minnesota pioneers in creating the urban ag legislation, and I, I would urge each and every one of you to advance that. We're currently working with um, Kimball Musk, who is Elon Musk's brother, a project that we call Foster Green, adopt a lot, adopt a plot, adopt a garden box. I had to go all the way to Colorado to find allies who realized that growing food isn't just about growing food. It's really about growing the lives and the quality of life for each and every resident in our community. And so I applaud the senator here because he hit it square on. This isn't really about a agriculture. And when people ask me, they say, Michael, you grow food? I say, yeah, that's what I'm do I do, but that's not really what I'm doing. And then they pause and they say, well, what are you doing? I say, I consider myself an egg patriot. I'm using agriculture as a platform, as a forum, to really get people to realize that civic engagement is the pathway to the future. And so how can we work together to really create a food-focused future that really brings all Minnesotans of every stripe, of every color, gives them access to capital, gives them access to land, gives them access to skills, and most importantly, gives them access to confidence so that they continue to grow the next generation of local food producers. Thank you for your time and patience. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cheney, and that is the uh, last test fire. So uh, we will now go to uh, member discussion. If there is any. Seeing none, Senator Putnam, do you have uh, last comments on your bill? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members, for listening. But I also want to thank all of the fine folks who came here to testify for us and tell their story. Uh, what we got was, I think, a comprehensive understanding of some of the struggles and some of the challenges that Minnesotans face in their entry point into agriculture. And I want to take another moment to thank my friend, uh, Mr. Cheney, for his closing statements about how agriculture is about more than food. 
It's clearly about food, but it's about the humans who eat it and the humans who grow it and their quest for their own human dignity to be respected and valued. Uh, and so I'm grateful that this committee took the time to have this opportunity to hear these voices and that now we can act on them. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we will be uh, laying this bill over for consideration in an omnibus bill as amended. Okay, next uh, on the docket is also Senator Putnam, Senate File 5308. Go ahead, Ms. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate File um, 5308 deals with wild rice. Um, members, uh, it's as big a part of our identity and our economy as is Prince. And I know that's a controversial statement, but let's start there. Um, and the thing with wild rice in Minnesota is that we have two economies and two cultures around its production. On the one hand, we have our friends who are wild rice cultivators who grow and market wild rice using flooded patties and specific seeds and harvesting practices. And on the other, we have tribal communities who employ traditional practices on natural stands and for whom wild rice has a profound cultural and spiritual significance. Now, in 2015, I believe, a program was created for wild rice research at the University of Minnesota. The Kimball Lab was set up to conduct research on how to conserve and propagate favorable characteristics in wild rice. Now, since then, the status of this research at the U has been a source of tremendous controversy and tension. Members, I'm sure every one of us in this room knows just how controversial, how difficult, how emotionally pregnant this issue is that we're dealing with today. Uh, and it's not just about the issue, it's about relationships between the stakeholders, between the tribes, the cultivators, and the U, and the Department of Agriculture, and an effort for all of us to get along. From my perspective, this controversy and part of its intensity comes from three different variables. It's about the disposition of resources, it's about symbolism, and it's about trust between organizations and communities. Now, last session, you may recall, we kept this program uh, as it was. Uh, it's uh, $450,000 per year to uh, support the research into cultivated wild rice at the Kimball Lab. But we tweaked it a little bit and said, you know, you guys get together. You guys talk to each other and figure out what we're going to do or we won't fund you the second year. So it's supposed to be a two-year program, members, as you may recall. We funded it for the first year and said, you guys get together, figure it out, come back to us, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do for the subsequent year with that funding. Uh, uh, our pals at the Department of Agriculture hosted sessions and meetings where folks came together to talk through some of these issues. Uh, there was not a programmatic uh, resolution or uh, um, uh, sort of suggested course of action in the future as a result uh, of those meetings. Uh, but their report was released a few months ago. Uh, but members, I want to focus on what we did, what we did in the Senate Ag Committee. We didn't just talk to the wild rice cultivators. We went to their farm. We went to our farm. farm. We, we, we talked. We visited with them. We visited with uh, Tom and his sons. We, we watched geese with them. And we learned about the lifestyle and the commitments and the investments of our uh, friends who do, grow cultivated wild rice. We also met with the tribes and their representatives. We met with Dean Burr at the U several times. And I called and had a phone conversation, a Zoom conversation with Dr. Jenny Kimball, the academic who runs this lab. As a result of all of those conversations, we came up with what I think is a pretty sweet compromise. Uh, what we have right now uh, is what is before you now, which is uh, a change uh, in the disposition of these resources and in the language that uh, governs its, uh, their use. Uh, the first thing we did is we removed the word breeding from the language in the bill because that language is problematic. Uh, members, just uh, imagine this. Uh, if you had a, a sibling or uh, a, a, someone you really, really cared about, um, someone uh, in whom you truly believed, and there was a program about breeding that entity, that word would be a problem. Given the, the frame of reference that's operating, that word is a really troubling, troubling word. We might not necessarily, all of us in this room, see that problem, but if you operate with that belief system, that's a huge problem. So we've removed that word and replaced it with a description uh, that uh, Dr. Kimball and I uh, discussed, uh, and that's the language of forward selection. Uh, secondly, uh, we split the distribution of the resources. $200,000 of this fund will now go towards research about the sustainability and propagation of natural stands. 
And then $250,000 of that remaining resource will be used as it has been uh, at the Kimball Lab as uh, Dr. Kimball's research uh, evolves. Members, we have a pretty significant opportunity right now when it comes to this issue to remove a hurdle, not just for wild rice cultivators, not just for the economy of the natural stand rice, but an opportunity to create an opportunity for trust and for growth between the U, the tribes, the Department of Agriculture, uh, and the cultivated rice farmers. Uh, in my preliminary conversations, um, they've been greeted with enthusiasm. Uh, members, we have potentially cracked this nut, this difficult, incredibly concerning issue for the last 10 years. We have, with this bill before us, solved it. We have achieved peace in the paddy. And on that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if you'd like to um, call up some uh, testifiers. Sure. Thank you, Senator Putnam. I have, uh, I don't know if you want to come together or one or the other. I have either Beth Nelson or Tom Godward. You're free to each come or one. It's up to you. I didn't know you were actually here. I was the nicer things about it. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. Sure, just state your name for the record, oh, and we'll sorry. be good to go. Thomas Godward. I farm up in Aiken, Minnesota, up north there. Go ahead. Uh, I'm on the Minnesota Cultivated Wild Rice Board, and uh, the board has agreed to accept this uh, proposal. And uh, we thank you kindly for your strong support to try to keep our industry alive. I don't have a lot to say, but I got to meet this guy, and he's cool, and, and I'm just a farmer. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, uh, Dean Burr, if you want to uh, come up also. Thanks for coming. <laughs> And you get to state your name for the record, and then you can begin your testimony. Mr. Chair, members, I'm Brian Boer. I'm Dean of the College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences, and Director of the Minnesota Agricultural Experiment Station at the University of Minnesota. Um, thanks for having me today, here today. I won't be quite as brief, I suspect, because uh, I'm a professor, so that's a problem. <laughs> um, but I am commenting on Senate File uh, 5308, proposal of the change as described. Uh, I'm grateful to have this opportunity. I agree that this is an important issue in equitability of research in cultivated wild rice, as well as Manuman, as um, uh, Anishinaabe referred to it. And this is an opportunity to move forward in that direction as described. Um, just some context um, that you've already had, but the cultivated wild rice research originated in 2016. Um, it is the $450,000 annual appropriation. And that was in compliance with the cultivated wild rice. With compliance with that, um, a cultivated wild rice researcher was hired in 2017. Um, since that time, the work that occurs on the research has been at the North Central Research and Outreach Center, uh, which is in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Um, it's primarily been focused on varietal development, um, improving traits as yield, disease resistance, resiliency, um, ease of mechanized harvesting, taste and cooking characteristics, and assessments of nutrient value um, that really does benefit everyone um, as a really um, uh, terrific crop for delivering nutrition. Um, and consistent uh, for clarity, we often get asked, uh, what are these techniques of forage selection that we're using? They are traditional um, techniques that we use. There is no genetic engineering. There is no gene modification uh, with wild rice. That's part of a Minnesota statute in existence. We do not use any of those techniques in that work. Um, and in significance, in recognition of the significance of wild rice uh, and manumen in native culture, the University of Minnesota began and initiated several programs that include a wild rice advisory group that has University of Minnesota leaders, including myself and the vice president for research, cultivated wild rice growers, including Red Lake, and tribal representatives that varied but have included tribal chairs as well as tribal natural resource management directors. Um, we've continued our Nibian Manuman, uh, which is water and rice, a wild rice uh, biennial symposium uh, with tribes that originated before um, this legislation. And that's focused on conservation and preservation of both Nibi and Manuman. 
Um, so we have been working to do some of this work that's being proposed here already and provide support for those efforts. Um, the f we also initiated the first tribal natural resources faculty member several years ago, and that is providing significant work across uh, agricultural and forest systems as well in collaboration with tribes. And we've been very active in native nutrition of within food systems, which also ties into this, um, through our Healthy Foods, Healthy Lives uh, programs and cooperatively with the Shakopee, Midwakanton, and Sioux uh, community that's been a terrific partner in, in forming that. Um, the proposal for funding enables resources to fuller, further fund perhaps these kinds of activities that are already underway. So it's heading to a place that has some potential to drive real results and engagement across both the tribes as well as cultivated wild rice growers. Um, uh, the Minuman Conservation, I, I do want to point out too that the Minnesota wild rice growers have engaged in conservation of natural stands of wild rice in addition in, in, or Minuman. Um, that con conservation research has evaluated the biodiversity of Minuman. That's critical in natural stands and any type of life form. Having greater diversity improves its sustainability, its viability. And so looking at how broad that is across Minnesota's lakes and rivers, which is really key for assuring those stands are, are sustainable. Um, the viability of seed, um, given that there are significant environmental pressures as we look at water pollution, invasive species, drainage, wet wet wetland removal, shoreline development, and other things that are challenging to Minuman in our lakes and rivers. Um, this is critical for sustainability in the environment and improves the resilience of natural stands of wild rice or Minuman. My opinion is that this, this meant to formally fund natural preservation and health of Minuman will further this existing work, and importantly with direct formal and equitable engagement with tribes, will move this work forward in conservation in the future. Happy to answer any questions you might have, so thank you. Thank you. Members, discussion, questions? Senator James. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Burr. Uh, this is a reduction in funding from what you've received in the past, as I understand it, this, this uh, bill here. So what will have to be reduced at the university? What things are you going to have to give up due to that lack of funding? Uh, Senator Putnam. Mr. Chair, if I may just uh, briefly, um, uh, our friend Tom and our friends at the cultivators have agreed to increase their checkoff to subsidize some of that so the gulf is not as big as it might seem. And with that, I'll defer to, to Dean uh, oh, Excuse me, Mr. Chair, but I'll, I'll refer to Senator Putnam for my next question before I refer to Dr. Burr. So when you say they've agreed to do that, what kind of dollars is that? So what will be the shortage after that happens? <coughs> Senator uh, I can fake it, but the experts are right there. If you, if you sure. Like Phone a friend. That would be great. Uh, Nelson, you wanted to state your name for the record? So sure. I'm Beth Nelson. Sure. I'm president of the Minnesota Cultivated Wild Rice Council. Um, this research program is, is very central to all of the projects that we do at the university, this particular project. And the funding is, is very crucial. Um, the growers did, the board did have a discussion uh, about a, 10 days ago, a week ago. Um, and they did recognize that a $200,000 shortfall in this project is going to be significant to us. While we may not be able to uh, increase our checkoff enough to make up $200,000, um, there is general agreement at this point that we will um, take action to look at increasing our checkoff and likely come up with about a $100,000 increase to, to that. So there will still be about a $100,000 shortfall. And just so everyone knows, um, the, the growers have not been taking a free ride on this. On average, over the last 10 years, they contributed about $170,000 already to the research program, directly through research projects or capital equipment such as a plot combine or a drone or things like that. So um, this would be in addition to that 170 that they, on average, are already giving. Senator Ames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and then, and then Dr. Burr. So there will be a shortage, not as much as I thought it would be, but there'll still be a shortage. Mm -hmm. So what changes will have to be made at the university to deal with that as far as this research goes? Dean Burr. Mr. Chair, Senator Dames. Um, one thing is the, the funding, the $250,000, will continue to support that faculty member who's doing the research. So that faculty member's work 
as all faculty at the university, um, we don't fully cover our costs in any program that we do. So we expect to look forward with support of wild rice growers and, and also tribes as well. Um, look for funding opportunities within the people who we're working with on that. And there are opportunities, particularly as we look towards the, as I mentioned, the cultivated wild rice growers have been really supportive of conservation of wild rice. It's good for the wild rice growers. It's good for tribes. And so we'll be looking for environmental uh, sources for funding that research in lakes and river stands that goes along with um, this activity. And we think uh, similar to some of our other programs working with tribes, there's real opportunities, and we we're just talking about diversity in agriculture, to generate those funds through grants and contracts. We expect to move in that direction. And the key part is maintaining that researcher so that they can go out and, and, and direct and, and work on those grants and contracts. Um, of course, if we don't obtain those, then we do um, look at reducing that, but um, that we'll continue along those lines. Thank you, Dr. Byrd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Westrom. <laughs> Mr. Chair, um, Senator Putnam, uh, <clears throat> new uh, former Senate member uh, Rod Scoy uh, raises wild rice, has been involved in the organization. Uh, is he supportive of this uh, uh, legislation, or where do he or other farmers stand on this uh, um, language? Senator Putnam. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, thank you for that question. Um, I did consult with Senator Scoy, former Senator Scoy, a great deal uh, last session, but I haven't run this particular language by him. Um, instead, I, I believe that uh, Ms. Nelson and, and uh, our friend Tom are representatives of the Wild Rice uh, Growers Council, and their support and enthusiasm uh, for this proposal uh, is welcome. So, Mr. Senator Chair, Westrom. Uh, Tom, uh, can you uh, comment on any uh, support of other farmers, uh, including uh, Mr. Scoy? Do you want to come back up to the podium? I could also okay. comment on that. I did speak with Senator Scoy uh, recently about this, and, and while he is disappointed to see the gap quite as big as it is for the cultivated wild rice program from the 450 down to the 250, um, is is pleased to see that a compromise has has come up um, around this around this project. Um, and as I mentioned, our um, board of directors did have a uh, discussion about a week ago or so, and. Um, we, we are very grateful for you to come up with such a compromise because when I first started about 30 years ago with the, with the industry, we did a lot of joint projects with, with the tribal communities. We did marketing projects. We did different legislative initiatives. There was the big DNR study that was done. And over, over time, we've kind of, other than Red Lake, who is the fifth largest cultivated wild rice producer in the state of Minnesota, some of those joint projects have, have kind of gone by the wayside. And we viewed this compromise as possibly bringing us all back together as Minnesota Minnesota wild rice, and it's important to all of us and how we can all work together. I really do believe that, that we have more in common than we do in disagreement areas, and I think this will be a good bridge. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may, to sort of extend sure. um, on Ms. Nelson's answer, um, uh, you know, and this is a, an email exchange I had with Dean Burr, too, that um, this has been a roadblock. This has been an impediment towards the building the kind of trust that it takes to do this kind of work. Uh, and um, I, I'm convinced in my conversations with uh, the individuals at this table and um, in Greater Minnesota and from Tom that, um, that getting rid of this roadblock is a path forward to all kinds of new collaborations and all kinds of new opportunities in Minnesota wild rice. Senator West. So Mr. Chair and uh, Dean, we've, we've been doing wild rice research for years, what what led to the roadblock that we're having to work through here? What 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 had to stop, or why did it have to stop? Dean Burr. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Westrom. A part of that was uh, well, the, the practical version was we had a researcher who worked in this area that left the university in about 2014-15. Um, we at that time were undergoing budget reductions. We didn't have the funding to move that forward. Uh, a second part of that was the agreed legislation that this came in as a budget rider under, that that was looking towards productivity in agriculture and food systems. Um, that also was a component of wild rice and potato within that uh, legislation as part of that as well. Um, 
there were there's also I think there was more of an awareness about the equitability issues and the issues related to the environment and tri tribal culture and spiritual aspects of wild rice that had been growing, and so we were looking at programs. For example, some of those items I talked about that we were doing before this legislation with tribes and conservation, those were happening already. So when this came forward, there was certainly that piece of okay, now we're funding this formally, that the tribes were not included in that conversation and that created additional tensions within the tribal community as well. We were attempting to bridge that through this process, but as Senator Putnam points out, having taken this formal action that is collaborative across these groups is a real step forward in creating that equitable approach that was just being discussed in other areas as well and recognizes that uh, natural, natural stands of wild rice is a key resource to tribes. It's part of their food chain. It's a key resource to Minnesota broadly and it's kind of an, an indicator of our water quality issues. So it really ties together how do we sustain the, the water quality, the wildlife, the wild rice within that. It is, as tribal communities look at it, this whole uh, you know, Earth's response to how we're um, polluting those areas. So this is a real opportunity to move forward with both sustaining the importance of wild rice in, you know, broadly um, available to people, but also how do we sustain and support our environment and, wild, uh, and natural stands of wild rice with that. Senator Western. So, Mr. Chair, uh, Dean. Burke, um, so will the research be just exclusive to the natural uh, wild rice? Is there any sort of hybrids or any other traits that will be looked at to improve the stand or uh, the, 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 the wild rice itself uh, from falling off easy into the, into the water uh, during heavy winds or other types of uh, climate conditions, weather-related events. What, what kind of research are we going to all be participating in? And uh, is there going to be uh, ways to improve these hybrids so, so they may be some of the, some of the hybrids that, are, that have stronger traits than, than others might be, might be uh, available to more and more farmers? Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, and I'll also um, like to Beth Nelson with Cultivated Wild Rice Growers in this. We will continue um, with the $250,000 to continue to develop um, uh, cultivated wild rice um, mm -hmm. through, again, traditional selection. So that work will be ongoing. And those are exactly those kinds of traits you're talking about, is the, you know, the effectiveness through mechanical harvesting, looking at tr other traits with you know, disease resistance and so on. At the same time, and what we're doing now is looking at uh, natural stands. And on the natural stands, that research, which has also been underway, um, issues of water quality, for example, are a huge issue. And that includes not just, you think about, you know, if you hear about sulfites in water and its impact on natural stands of wild rice, it also affects um, cultivated stands of rice as well. Water levels and hydrology in the state is changing, whether that's from drainage or dams. Um, raising water levels, changing water levels in lakes and rivers has impacts on natural stands. Um, development, shoreline development. Um, as we see more and more people looking for that cherished Minnesota uh, lake, um, having boats and other things come under those lakes, things like duck hunting. Uh, you know, fortunately, we no longer use lead shot with duck hunting, but those are aspects of natural uh, occurrences in lakes and river stands. So, if we look at that environmental side, in that case, we do no changes. The the natural rice remains natural rice. We do not look at how we adapt those rice to those stands. One area that does come in, and this is with tribal ricers we'd work with, is there is some seeding of lakes to try to reestablish. We can help to, because of our knowledge with the types of wild rice, which is deep within the tribal communities from you know, historical knowledge uh, coming into that. But we can help to identify which, which varieties might, which types might thrive better in the ecosystem that's there. And it's that blending, which we do with some of our, our nutritional research, is blending tribal traditional knowledge and understanding of natural stands along with Western science to try to really advance that. Because as we hear from tribes, um, natural stands of wild rice are under extreme uh, stress now. And you can imagine with the dry years we've had, uh, with some of the climate changes, lack of snowfall this winter, lakes not freezing, that all impacts natural stands. Um, and so that's a key part. We'll be blending that knowledge across those areas. Senator Westrom, anything else? Okay. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just wanted to thank you, Senator Putnam, for your work and for Dr. Burke and Ms. Nelson and Tom for getting this solved. What a, what a, a great uh, work that you did. Uh, but I do want to call it Tom a little bit. And you're not just a farmer. Uh, I grew up on a farm, and uh, the hats you have to wear 
the things you do and a tribute not only to you, but the farm community and all farmers. Uh, I, I was uh, raised on the farm, so as my dad uh, taught me and I saw all the things and all the hats and all the things that we did as a family, we had animals too, so, but those that raised crops and even the ones that were here earlier, it just, you could see the passion and the love they have for raising their own food and it's, 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 a, it's a great, uh, agriculture is just great. Uh, but I wanted to just, you're old enough, Tom, and I'm old enough, and remind of Paul Harvey when he did the So God Made a Farmer. I think maybe we should all listen to that tonight and just think about that and all the things that agriculture and farmers do. So thank you for being a farmer. Any other members? If not, I will also, I just want to add, I know, Senator Putnam, that you worked very hard on this and... Um, we're very excited that, that we seem to have come to some agreement. So uh, congratulations on the work and, and to your partners, too, who were uh, you know, willing willing to, to, to come to this compromise. So, so thanks. Any final comments, Senator Putnam? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and on that front, I think it's really important that we acknowledge Senator Kunish um, and her incredible hard work and her openness, her creativity, and her curiosity um, and her ability to participate in all these conversations at the same time. Um, I think that, like, together we actually learned a whole lot. Uh, about all these different perspectives on this issue. Um, and we wouldn't have come to this compromise, which I truly think is significant. We wouldn't have gotten there without Senator Kunish. So I think uh, I, I want to personally thank her, but also um, uh, acknowledge uh, the work of this committee and people who have tried to struggle with this issue in the past. But it feels pretty good because I think we took care of it. Okay, and with that then, uh, Senate File 5308 is laid over for possible inclusion, and we have one more bill. Senator Dornick, you are next. Thank you, Senator Dornick. To uh, Senate File 4069, please. Meat cutting and butchery training grants appropriation. When you're ready, Mr. Senator. Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think 10 minutes will be good for this, but we'll find out. We'll see how it goes. So, uh, Senate File 4069 appropriates $375,000 from the general fund to provide grants to secondary career and technical education programs for the purpose of offering instruction in meat cutting and butchery. This is a one time appropriation. Grants may be used for uh, cost including but not limited to equipment required for a meat cutting program, facility renovation to accommodate meat cutting, and training facility to teach the fundamentals of meat processing. Now this funding in this bill would allow MDA to revive the meat education and training grant that was funded uh, at $350,000, the one-time uh, investment in 2022, the Supplement Agriculture and Broadband Law. Uh, now, this bill reflects the language enacted in 22 with the following changes, which is the dates updated. They increased the total appropriation to 375000 to accommodate the unfunded grants requested, uh, increased the maximum grant to 75000 per, uh, partially account for the inflation, and formatting a change to improve the readability and technical changes as suggested uh, by the reviser. And I have two testifiers, uh, Eric Swatsky, Minnesota Association of Agriculture Educators. I believe he's online. And then also Lauren Dower from the Farm Bureau. Thank you very much, Senator Dornick. So our first testifier is a uh, friend of the committee, Eric Swatsky. Mr. Swatsky, if you would please uh, unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Can you see me, Chair Putnam? Yep, you're good. You look great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, yeah, Chair Putnam and members of the committee. My name is Eric Swatsky. I'm an ag ed educator at West Central Area Schools, which is located in Barrett. Welcome to our meat processing lab. Uh, it's an example of some of the many school labs that are currently being equipped to teach meat processing. Although our trailer was purchased with a USDA grant, our school did receive a meat education and training grant from the Minnesota Department of Ag 
uh, which we use to install a backup generator and our portable water and septic connections to get the lab up and running. So this 36 foot trailer has all stainless steel working spaces. I don't know if you can see, but a three bay sink, two hand washing stations, a meat grinder, a mixer, stuff, uh, stuffer, uh, and its own freezer. Tomorrow, this trailer is actually gonna be inspected by our local MDA meat inspector. And we have secured a wholesaler that'll be ready to ship boxed beef, pork, chicken, and definitely turkey directly to our <laughs> school. Our students have been completing food safety and safe knife handling training. And on the day this trailer arrived, uh, I'll never forget the palpable energy of our students. They were chanting and cheering like we had just won the state basketball tournament. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, this is an educational area that is in demand. It is not just in demand by the industry, it is in demand by our students. Uh, even in fact, those same students have now been begging me for the last two weeks to create a new advanced meat processing class so that they can take this again next year and just be working, working, working. They just wanna be in here all the time. Uh, I want to thank the committee for hearing Senate File 4069. In the first round of grants, we were just one example of the investments that supported meat training. Uh, Ashby Schools will be sharing this trailer with us, but they also have used that meat grant to convert a space in the school to be an inspected processing lab. Uh, I found out the other day that Recorey Schools did two wholesale hog carcasses last week. Uh, and Lock Farrell Valley is another example. They've created a mobile trailer of their own, uh, even in partnership with Bridgewater College. Nine schools have benefited from this first round of grants, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. In the last year, MBA has assisted with numerous meat processing workshops for agriculture teachers that have been um, standing room only in every single one of them. The demand is swelled, uh, and teachers are developing the confidence that they can undertake this needed area of agricultural education, especially after developing strong working relationships with the MBA meat inspection staff. I fully suspect that the number of applications will only grow as students start to envision their ability to offer meat processing. And I definitely ask for your support at Senate File 4069 and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sawatsky. Uh, now, Mr. Mr. Dower, if you would, please. State your full name for the record and commence testimony when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Chair Putnam, members of the committee. My name is Lauren Dower, and I'm the public policy specialist for the Minnesota Farm Bureau. Uh, I have the privilege of representing 30,000 farm and rancher members from across the state. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 4069, which would add additional uh, appropriate one-time funding for the uh, uh, education, training, and meat cutting. So our, our members understand the importance around uh, having adequate livestock processing facilities throughout Minnesota. Uh, we believe with the continued support of the meat and education training program, more students and schools uh, will be able to expand upon career opportunities that are essential to communities. Uh, overall, this is a great program. Uh, we have seen the benefits uh, in many ways. It goes beyond the practical hands-on learning by providing an opportunity to support the vitality of our rural communities. It is important that our young people have the uh, opportunity to learn these skills, which in turn uh, lead them to finding good, high paying jobs while remaining in the communities they currently reside. Um, we are grateful for the, for the author's work on this and thank you to the co-authors as well and thank you Senator uh, Chair Putnam, who's also a co-author on this for hearing this legislation today. Thanks, Mr. Dyer. Members, any questions, comments for uh, Senator Dornick or his testifier? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we had a, a meat cutting uh, um, retail out outfit in Howard Lake, which is part of my district, and uh, the owner uh, was approaching his 80s. He had a wife that was in uh, very dire straits with cancer and was trying to find someone to be... Uh, a teacher or a mentor to someone who would come alongside to uh, do uh, the training and background information on cutting meat. And um, it was finally he found a young man who was willing to come forward and, and be taught by this gentleman. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's necessary to keep these type of uh, meat processing. Uh, it's a, it's an attraction for people who want to see their own meat be processed and be able to bring their meat to the, the locker or to the processing plant. And so I applaud you, Senator Dornick, for bringing this forward and for those uh, others who are pushing this to uh, our schools across the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Kunish. Thank you. Um, I have a question for uh, Mr. Swatsky. Is, is, are those trailers usable year-round? Mr. Swatsky. 
Chair Putnam and Senator Quinnish, yes, uh, they are. We are all set up. We have heat and air. I've got split air system in here, so we're able to use it year-round. I've got a heated um, water supply line and a heated septic uh, drainage line, too. So we can move this around, plug it in, and keep operating any time of year. Senator Quinnish. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, I just uh, want to uh, highlight uh, this idea started a few years ago, and uh, Mr. Swatsky was kind of at the ground level, uh, Farmers Union, Farm Bureau, other ag groups, of course, coming out of the pandemic and the uh, uh, meat cutting shortage that we really experienced. And so I just uh, want to take this uh, opportunity to help go full circle with, you know, this is... Um, this is where things started and, and uh, looks like great progress. So, Mr. Swatsky, appreciate your leadership and efforts on this. Uh, um, any, any uh, Mr. Swatsky, not to put you on the spot, but any, uh, any uh, story or two that you could just uh, share with us uh, with, with uh, both uh, the, either the meat trailer or the state grant and uh, maybe, maybe something that sticks out with you as students that that have uh, participated in the uh, uh, anything yet uh, to date, and I guess there's probably more to come. But uh, just kind of an open-ended question. Just uh, any any further insights you can share with us that just kind of really put the exclamation point on the interest of students, Mr. Sawatsky. Senator Westrom, yeah, and, and thank you for all that work that you did to start this all off a few years ago as well. So yeah, it. Uh, the best thing that I can explain to you is that this is as real world as it gets. These students have been a part of this entire process. They are the ones that are helping us to level the trailer. They are the ones that are working right next to the uh, plumber and learning about what we needed to put in to make this work so that we have potable water. They are the ones that saw that we needed a backup generator and saw them how to use uh, government support systems to make this happen and that there are projects like this, not just schools, but this legislature has done a great job of doing that for meat processors. So now you've got young um, adolescents that are just about to start their careers who might be able to now be inspired to and be supported in creating a butcher shop or uh, just to do a little callback. I'm from Waverly originally, so Idle's Meat Market of Hard Lake was a wonderful place. They had the best jerky when I was growing up and went ice fishing. And I would have loved to take it over a place like that back in the day, but I didn't have a training experience like this. So this is just this is an amazing story. Thank you, Mr. Swatsky. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Swatsky. And just uh, while you're on, while we've got the opportunity to have you here, why don't you uh, just tell us a little bit about the other uh, part of the greenhouse uh, that's at, at the facility in West Central area and just how these things really kind of harmonize and work together. But uh, I, th I think it'd be interesting to just let the committee know. I mean, this is the type of thing that can go on at, uh, at, at our ag departments uh, across the state. But uh, I know you have a greenhouse there that's just recently opened and uh, that kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, if you want to just fill us in on that for 30 or 60 seconds, I think it'd be helpful. Mr. Swatsky, please brag. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have a, we got our uh, Lions International, our organizations locally got together and got us a grant and we used that money and multiplied it uh, three times over. We ended up getting $300,000 and built, built a greenhouse for, for hunger relief with plant science education. So we're growing food in our greenhouse uh, for our local food shelves and that led to somebody telling me about the USDA NEFA grants. So we wrote that grant two years ago to butcher with the intent of career training, but the meat being brought to the food shop when it's done. So that's an end goal. We're not there yet, but we've got the, the facilities there. Now it's getting through some, some of the red tape, but we'll get there really soon. The, the, the groceries are the groceries. The uh, produce is easy. Meat's a little bit more challenging, and so we're working through some of those last wrinkles to get there. Okay. Members, any other questions or comments for uh, Senator Dornick or his testifiers? Closing comments, Ms. Senator Dorney? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank my, uh, uh, my testifiers and uh, Mr. Swatsky for the work that you do teaching the kids. Uh, it's such an important uh, trade, if you will, or, uh, you know, because I remember on the, growing up on the farm, there was a locker, there used to be a locker uh, almost in every little town, and, and a lot of them are gone now. And so it's a definitely a need. So thank you for your work, and uh, to my other testifier, 
Mr. Dower, thank you, and also to my co-authors, Senator Westrom, Senator Dames, Senator Anderson, and uh, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for co-authoring and for hearing the bill. Thank you, Senator Dower, for your, for your work on this issue. Um, uh, I'll say again, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought this to us, and I'm eager to support it. Thank you. So uh, Senate file 4069 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, members, that's the end of our, our uh, scheduled business for the day. Our next meeting will be Monday, April 15th, tax day. There will be no meeting this Wednesday because of Eid. On that day, we have two things, two larger things that we'll deal with. One there are two bills that are the governor, governor's supplemental budget. So we will, we will hear Senate File 5365, the governor's supplemental ag budget, and Senate File 5366, the governor's supplemental broadband budget. Both bills will be laid over. Then we will hold a walkthrough and test testimony on the Omnibus Agriculture Finance Bill. The vehicle for the finance bill is Senate File 3955. A Delete Everything Amendment will be posted as soon as it's available, likely toward the end of this week, members. Um, and then uh, member Wednesday, April 17th, the committee will do markup amendments and vote the bill out of committee. Do we have any questions about our schedule moving forward? Awesome. There being no business, more business before the committee, we are now adjourned. <laughs>